Unit 9.2, Beam Deflection by Integration. In this unit, we're focused on the following outcome. Demonstrate the ability to calculate normal and shear stress and deflection in beams. In previous units, we discussed how to calculate normal stress and shear stress. Here, we will focus on deflection. The lesson outcome is to demonstrate the ability to find beam displacement and slope by integration. Let's begin by considering this beam. This is a simply supported beam with a pin at the left end and a roller and two point loads. There's a cantilever end on the right side. And if we were to draw the internal moment diagram, it would look like this. Now let's consider what the deflected shape of this beam would look like. We can approximate the deflected shape of the beam based on the loading conditions, the supports, and the internal moment diagram. And here, this red line represents an approximation of the deformed shape. The dotted red line represents the original shape drawn as a line through the centroid. When we draw the shape, we take into consideration several things. First of all, at the supports, the deflection of the beam will be zero. There is no deflection at the supports. This is important. Also, near where the vertical loads are applied, the deflection of the beam will be in the direction of the loads. Additionally useful information comes from the moment diagram. Where the internal moment in the beam is positive, we have a shape in our beam which is concave upward. Where the internal moment diagram is negative, we have a concave downward shape in our beam. Thus, we see that there is a relationship between what we'll call curvature, this is the Greek letter psi, which is equal to 1 over the radius of curvature. And that's equal to the internal moment divided by EI. E is the modulus of elasticity. I is the moment of inertia of the cross section. Together, E and I are called the flexural rigidity. As the flexural rigidity increases by either increasing the uh, material stiffness or increasing the moment of inertia, for example, using a bigger cross section, when this value increases, the curvature decreases, and so does the deformation. And the opposite is true. So, what we see is a relationship between curvature and the moment. Where the moment is zero, that will be an inflection point in our deformed shape. Here I've shown the actual deformed shape of the beam for a given value for modulus of elasticity and moment of inertia. In this lesson, we will learn how to develop this equation for deformation or deflection in the beam based on the internal moment. We will call the equation for the deformed shape the elastic curve, and it's going to be a function of x. We'll use the symbol lowercase v to define the elastic curve. Now we are able to find the elastic curve because of this relationship here, which is that the second derivative of the elastic curve equation is approximately equal to the moment divided by the flexural rigidity. To summarize, if we have an equation for the elastic curve, which is the displacement function, if we take the derivative of the elastic curve equation, we get an equation for the slope of the elastic curve. If we take the second derivative of the elastic curve, multiply it by the flexural rigidity, we get the internal moment in the beam. And it's an approximation, but it's very close. We can couple this information with what we learned previously about the relationship between moments, shears, and applied loads. If we start with our elastic curve, take the first derivative, we get the slope. Take the second derivative, multiply by flexural rigidity, we get the moment. Take the derivative of that, we get the shear. The derivative of that, we get the applied load. And we can see the link between the load and the deformation. Based on the example we considered previously, here's the elastic curve shown in the bottom graph. The derivative of that is the slope. The derivative of that multiplied by flexural rigidity is our moment curve. The derivative of that is our shear. Now, we usually don't know the elastic curve to start with. What we typically know are these three, the load, the internal shear, and the internal moment. 
So what we're going to do to find the elastic curve is we're going to begin with equations for our internal moment. Then we'll integrate once to get the slope, integrate a second time to get the elastic curve. Once we have the elastic curve, we know the deflection in the beam at any point. It's very useful. So here are the steps in the procedure for finding slope and displacement by integration. First, determine the equation or equations for internal moments in terms of x in our beam. When writing the equations, we need to remember the positive sign convention. See unit 5.1 to review how to write the equations for internal moments in a beam. The second step is using this relationship, the flexural rigidity times the second derivative of the elastic curve is equal to the moment, we will integrate our moment equations twice to get expressions for slope and then displacement in terms of x. Step three is to apply our boundary conditions to find the integration constants. When we integrate our moment equations, we will incorporate our integration constants, which then must be solved for. We will use the boundary conditions to find them. What are our boundary conditions? Well, they're shown here in this diagram. Our boundary conditions are found at our supports. If you recall from previous discussion, where we have a support, our displacement, shown by this delta, is zero. There is no displacement at the supports, and that applies to supports at the end of the beam, supports in the middle of the beam. For a simply supported beam, there are always two supports and therefore two boundary conditions. If we have a cantilever beam, as shown in number five, then there's just a single support, but there are still two boundary conditions. They are that the displacement is zero, but the slope is also zero at the support. Free ends of beams or internal pins or hinges do not provide any boundary conditions. The final step is to apply the continuity conditions, if necessary, to find remaining integration constants. If we have to use more than one moment equation to define the moment in our beam, then we will have more than two constants of integration. Uh, because, of our, because our boundary conditions will only allow us to solve for two of our constants, we need to apply our continuity conditions to find the remaining integration constants. So let's define what our continuity conditions are. Let's suppose we have this beam shown here. Because there is a point load in the middle of the beam, that there is a discontinuity in the bending moment. So we'll need to use two equations to define the moments in this beam. Moment one equation is for x from zero to a, and moment two equation from a to the end c here, which is a length a plus b. When we integrate our moment equation twice, uh, we will get slope and then elastic curve equations. And we'll have slope equations and elastic curve equations for both sides of the beam. Our continuity conditions state that our slope for the left side of the point and the slope, which is our theta one equation, and the slope for the right side of the point, which is our theta two equation, must be equal at the point where they come together, which is a distance x equals to a. That is one continuity condition. The second continuity condition states that when displacement is evaluated at a distance x equal to lowercase a with the first equation, it must equal the displacement when evaluated with the second equation at the same point, which means the, there is no discontinuity between uh, the deflection equations at the point where they come together. Thus, they're called the continuity conditions. Now, suppose for the same beam that we use two different set of that sets of axes. For the left side, we will use this x1 axis, which starts at a and goes to the right. For the right side of the beam, we will define a second axis, which is x2 going from point c to the left. We will still write two equations for our moments, one for the left side, one for the right, and equations for slope and displacement for both sides. Our continuity equations will look like this. Where the two equations come together, the slope in the equation for the left, when evaluated at the point where they meet, must be equal to negative the slope of the second equation 
at the point where they meet. You can see this makes sense. If, uh, if this is our deflected shape shown by the blue line, then our slope is negative coming from A. And it's negative at the point where it meets the second equation for slope. Coming from the right, our theta 2 equation shows that slope uh, at the point where it meets with the second equation is actually become positive. So the magnitudes of the slopes are the same, but the signs are different. Our second continuity condition, however, is the same, which is that the magnitude and sign of the deflection at the point where the two equations meet are equal. So we will use those continuity conditions in addition to our boundary conditions to find all of our integration constants. Once we do that, we have equations for our elastic curve. And then we can use it to find the displacement at any point along the beam. And we're done.